So good morning, everyone. Um, we have a small group here, but I'm sure a very friendly group. <laughs> um, I think hopefully more people will be coming in as uh, we just wrapped up the other session. So please feel free to come in and, and join us. Uh, for those of you I haven't had a chance to meet yet, I'm Patricia Cochran. Um, I'm going to be the moderator for this session today. And let me just tell you a little bit about how this is going to operate. We've got two speakers that will be going during this first period, and then we're going to have a break, and then our next two speakers. We'll have our first two speakers give their talks, and then we'll have uh, some time for questions following both speakers, uh, after both speakers. So, uh, And we've got about 15 minutes for each. We do have a rapporteur, Bianca, who's going to be taking notes. One of our, our fabulous young researchers. We're, we're also, those of us who are getting ready to pass the baton, all this, we're really happy to see our young people uh, coming in behind us. So uh, let me uh, first uh, introduce uh, Siegfried, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. I can pronounce Alaska Native <laughs> names very well, but I, I don't do well on this side of the, the world. Uh, that she is a senior lecturer at the University of Akureyri. She is a nurse and midwife and a doctoral student. Her main research focus has been on pain and pain management during childbirth, but now she will talk about childbirth services in rural areas and how the childbirth services have changed in Iceland during the last decades. Uh, Sigifer is going to talk about giving birth in rural areas. Thank you so much. I know it's not an easy thing to pronounce Sigfrider, but it's a little bit easier to pronounce Inka, my last name. <laughs> so it's a clue for you. Yes? Well, I'm going to talk about giving birth in rural areas. And planning the healthcare service in rural areas is not an easy thing. And people do not agree if it's a part of normal healthcare service to give unhealthy women in normal pregnancy the opportunity to give birth in their hometown or not. And it has been a hot topic in Iceland whether it is safe to give birth, where it is safe to give birth and where not. Number of hospitals have given women the opportunity to give birth uh, there has been decreasing year by year and every now and then the newspaper published news about women delivering on their way to hospitals. And I have a few here that's telling us the story when the women were delivering on a 160 kilometers uh, speed on the way to hospital. So I want to pick up the topic where it is safe and where not to give birth. And if it's always the good, uh, a good thing to decrease numbers of childbirth places in rural areas, because as we all know, uh, here in Iceland, uh, snowstorms and uh, bad weather is one of the things that we can count on every winter, not just one and one. Uh, a number of hospitals have, uh, that have given the women opportunity to give birth, as I said, has been decreasing year by year. And some people that say that it's okay to decrease the numbers of hospitals that women are allowed to give birth in. It's okay because they can just drive to the hospital when they have their uh, due time. And uh, I want to say that the due time is in four weeks period. And I know it's not an easy thing for women to go and stay for two, three, four weeks and uh, waiting for their child to be born. Uh, it's often very complicated and not easy for them. And believe me, it's not an easy thing to do. When you are in late pregnancy, you are tired, you find no comfortable position to sleep in, and you have to go to the bathroom ten times a night, and you're worried about if your husband is going to make it uh, to the place, uh, perhaps driving one or two hours during snowstorm to be, be with you when you're delivering your child. And I know it's not easy decision for the people who have to uh, uh, offer and decide what kind of service their hospital uh, is going to offer. I know it's not an easy thing to do, but I want to uh, uh, state that safety is not always 
the main thing. I think the mummy is uh, deciding too much to decrease the number of places. But I want to show you a little bit about uh, how childbirth uh, numbers have been changing in Iceland. And one of the doctors at the FSA, Alexander Smaurason, has lent me a part of his slide that he has already presented here in Akureyri. And uh, uh, let's look at how number of childbirth and birth places have been changing in Iceland for the past few years. And in this picture you can see how numbers of childbirths in Iceland have been changed since, since 1841. And yes, the childbirth is the whole country, not just in one hospital, as, you, as some of you might uh, uh, think, because it's very, uh, very few childbirths. Uh, the figure shows an, a group of five years, and the number has been uh, about for about 2,000 to 2,500 until 1941, and then after that it's about 4,500 4, or so for the past, past few years. And on that slide you can see it a be, it's a better uh, from 1951, how the childbirth number have been changing. And here on that slide you can see how the childbirth numbers uh, here in the north part and northeast part has been changing uh, since 1972. And this is this is the whole whole area. This is uh, FSA and this is the east part of Iceland. So you see that uh, the the numbers have not been changing so much. Uh, but uh, uh, it's not the same regarding the childbirth places. And on that slide you can see that from 1972, uh, where the childbirth places was 21, no, was 25, I say, how they were, uh, uh, where they were around Iceland. It's a pretty short distance between them here in the northern part and western part and here in the capital area. But uh, here it's a, it's a long way for the women to go to uh, give birth. But it's not the same here in the south part because it's not so much snow. But here in the northern part you have mountain roads and snowstorm maybe as last uh, winter very, very often. So it's not uh, the same to go uh, to give birth in a hospital. Uh, one or one and a half hour way if you live somewhere here in the northern part or if you live here in the southern part. Uh, the weather is, uh, is uh, a big, <laughs> big problem here often in the northern part. And uh, of course women in high risk pregnancy, they have to go to the, to the biggest places where they have uh, as much technology as possible to uh, uh, be safe. But I want to talk about the women in normal pregnancy and we have a figure that is, we can say that they are safe although they uh, deliver at smaller places. They don't need technology there. Uh, good maternity care during pregnancy is the key to a good conclusion uh, in childbirth. And there's a lot of uh, studies that I could have shown you if I had more time to uh, convince you that this is right. But this is the uh, development. Uh, the childbirth places now in 1913 uh, is nine. It has been decreasing from one. Uh, this one here at Sjökroker has, has stopped uh, uh, allowing women to give uh, babies here. So it's Isa further and Akureyri and Neskopstad. And I don't know about you, but my opinion is that uh, this is too few places for uh, pregnant women to decide where they give birth. And I'm talking about women in normal pregnancy. I'm not talking about if they are giving birth too soon, maybe 32 or 33 weeks gestation. I'm not talking about that. Uh, I'm just talking about the normal pregnant, pregnant women. And I also want to show you that the Directorate of Health, they uh, pronounced or published in 2007 uh, 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 guidelines uh, 
uh, for uh, ma women and doctors, uh, which is uh, uh, servicing pregnant women during the pregnancy. A uh, certain group of hospitals that uh, women are uh, allowed to give birth in, depending on how their pregnancy and how their maternity story have been before that. So we have from the government or from the Directorate of Health certain uh, guidelines uh, to uh, publish and to, to ask women to go to more technology hospital if needed. And here you have the, the different kind of service that are offered around Iceland. Uh, and uh, here in 2012, the childbirth was 4,421, and home birth uh, around the Iceland, 95. And uh, as you may know, uh, Iceland is very, has a very low maternity, uh, no mortality rate. So that leads me to uh, questions. What kind of service should be offered in rural areas? And what is acceptable service around uh, to regulations in the country? Is more technology always the best for every childbirth? And what is security in childbirth? And how is security measured? So perhaps I offer more questions than facts, I know that. And I want to ask everyone to be critical and think about if it's always a good thing that childbirth places are so few in Iceland. As I know that there's not enough money to have childbirth places in every small town, I know that. But some people talk like Reykjavik and Akureyri is the only safe place to give birth in. And I totally do not agree with that. And one of the things that keep, birth, keep people uh, away from the capital cities, and we want to have people have the opportunity to live someplace else than just in the capital city, uh, we don't uh, I want people to live perhaps on an island or have no health care service, but we want to them to have proper service where they live. And they, lo they want to live outside the capital city and they want to give birth as near their hometown as possible. So why are birthplaces closed down? Probably this is the two main reasons. Uh, lack of money and uh, issues regar regarding security. Some people say this is the safest place for everyone to give birth. And in some countries, or at, at, at least at some places, uh, pregnant women, it's about 80 to 85 percent uh, of them go to caesarean section. That's not a safe thing to do. Uh, but is this a safe place to give birth in? I would say no. But one of the papers that are presenting a story from a woman uh, that I brought with me gave birth at that uh, place. But it was like this one because it was in late December and very cold and windy and snowstorm outside. It was not a safe place for her to give birth. It would have been much better for her to give birth at the hospital where there were qualified midwives to give uh, to assist her and not to go to the out in the snowstorm giving birth in her car with her husband. This is not a safe place either, but a child was born there yes, uh, last year. And I also want to say that even though uh, it's not an easy way to sometimes to go between places in Iceland in, during the winter time when the snowstorms are, it can be very dangerous also during the summertime. You can perhaps see the sheep which are sometimes running around uh, uh, on the road when we are driving. And many of these stories published in this paper here, they tell, they tell a story 
that uh, their husband and their ambulance, uh, ambulance was driving very, very fast. And uh, perhaps on a uh, twice uh, as much speed as are allowed on the road. So uh, that's just uh, also an issue of safety, not just to have uh, equipment, the opportunity to go to CSR section if needed. And I think that has been uh, too little uh, <clears throat> information to people <clears throat> about this, not just uh, focusing on childbirth. And uh, papers also published uh, very often stories how childbirth was in ambulances and in aeroplanes. And for me, this is not uh, always the best place. Uh, some uh, some areas, I, uh, at least in Norway, they uh, say it's about 40 childbirth. If it's less than 40 childbirth every year at a birthplace, it's closed down. So perhaps it's just two or three or four childbirth in the ambulance each year, depends on where, where the ambulance is. That should not be a safe place for women. And I'm always talking about women in normal pregnancy, not the high-risk ones, because that's a whole another thing. They need technology, I know. Uh, this couple and this little boy was born uh, last winter, and they, their story is just horrible to read, because they were uh, uh, they were at very dangerous place during very, very uh, bad weather, and it was just not good for them or safe for them at all. And now I have two minutes left and two slides, so it's okay. <laughs> uh, my point is not to criticize the people who have to uh, decide where women are allowed to give birth or not. Uh, my point is just to point uh, out the disadvantages that uh, can have uh, not to give, give healthy women in healthy pregnancy the opportunity to give birth in their home areas, in rural areas. We also have to meet that in normal pregnancy the child can be born sometimes during the four-week period. That is uh, from 37 weeks up to 41 weeks. So it's not a question about going to stay in Akure or other places uh, uh, just two or three days because before the child will be born. It can be four weeks or so. We also have to admit that in the northern part of Iceland, the weather is not always the best, at least not for a pregnant woman in labor. And I know any laboring woman that would say, I, I don't know any laboring women that would say it is comfortable to sit in a car tied down for an hour or two, or with two or three minutes before, between contractions. It is important, if we want people to live outside the biggest city in, uh, in our country, we have to look at the whole pictures and look at childbirth service for, for women in normal pregnancy as a part of normal healthcare service, and not as a luxury that can be cut down if institutions get enough, not enough money. The government in our countries have to provide money so pregnant women don't have to give birth in snowstorm during the winter time somewhere far, far away from security and midwives. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll have our next uh, Speaker, we're going to take questions uh, after the next speaker, and then we'll do for both. Uh, Hilda Gunnar, and I apologize again for the pronunciation, <laughs> is a director of emergency education and quality field, director of nursing and manager of office and research at Operary Hospital. She is also an assistant professor at the School of Health Sciences of the University of Akrari and a local project manager in a northern periphery program. Today she is going to talk about 
Factors Affecting Recruitment and Retention of Health Care Professionals in Rural Areas. Can you all hear me? Yes. Anyway, I can start while he's, uh, he's uh, working on this. Um, well, it's, it's nice. I'm, I'm glad that I have the opportunity to tell you about this uh, big transnational project uh, that uh, I've been involved with for the last two years. And uh, I will tell you about um, uh, what we call uh, yeah, some factors which might and possibly, thank you, affect recruitment and retention of healthcare professionals in rural areas. And uh, some people might think how on earth that uh, has any links to climate change. But we all know that, especially those who were here yesterday, that we have seen that climate change um, has something to do with social and economical effects. And uh, that's exactly what we have been finding out in, these, um, in this project, that social, economical, and especially professional uh, factors play a big role in um, and how we can recruit and retain healthcare professionals in rural areas. So that has actually a very good link into, into the title of this Congress. Uh, but first of, first of all, for those who don't know, um, uh, I'm, I'm here standing here as a representative of, uh, from a Northern Periphery program. And uh, as I say, inclu I'm included in a project which is called Recruitment and Retention of Healthcare Providers in Remote Rural Areas. And that's a project which is funded by the European Regional Development Fund, which is within the Northern um, Periphery Programme. Some of you might know, know, uh, know this area, but this is the Northern Periphery uh, Programme area. And uh, this project, Recruit and Retain, is a project which sets out to find solutions to the persistent problems of difficulties in recruiting and retaining high quality frontline healthcare providers from the remote rural areas of uh, Northern Europe. And we are also hoping that with, uh, with our effective, I can say that, transnational cooperation, uh, we will show some success because the first thing of all, all is to talk together, work together, learn from each other and uh, try to yeah, let the cooperation be successful. So that's very important. And this is uh, the group, as you, uh, which is taking part in this project. It's a big group. Uh, was taking at uh, a meeting in Iluli set in Greenland last year. We have participants from seven countries. There are eight partners, and we come from Iceland, Sweden, Norway, uh, Greenland, Canada, uh, Ireland, and then we have two partners from Scotland, and uh, uh, one of the partners in Scotland is leading the, uh, uh, this uh, big project. Uh, before I go any further, um, there has been a lot written about recruitment and retention in rural remote areas, and the main results tell us that the lack of healthcare staff in rural areas is an international problem. It's not just the problem of uh, very remote country like Iceland is with only three inhabitants per square kilometer. It's a lack everywhere. Uh, and recruiting healthcare staff can be difficult, and uh, especially from uh, these factors, social, professional, and geographical uh, reasons. We have also studies which point out that the organization of uh, training and education in the rural area itself increase the likelihood of keeping them there and we have very good experience, first of all, from Akureyri, when we have had the nursing studies for the last 20 years, 
and it has definitely shown a huge success in retaining and recruiting nurses in, uh, in the areas around Dakure and the rural areas. But we also have experiences from medical students in Canada and Tasmania in Australia. And uh, one of the leaders uh, of this uh, medical uh, studies uh, programs is uh, a partner in our project. So uh, we think we are really lucky to have him there. And we also have very good experience from other areas, like, for example, Finnmark in Norway. And for those of you who don't know where Finnmark is, it's almost on the top of the, um, of the globe, at least from my point of view. It's very far away. And uh, they have uh, been very successful in terms of how they can encourage recruitment and retention um, by ensuring professional development and preventive professional isolation, which makes healthcare staff wanting to stay in this uh, area. So what, oh sorry, I've been talking and talking and not telling you anything. We can go through this, but I hope you understood what I was saying. So what's the obje objective of our pro project? We would like, first of all, to get some, to get the answers to these questions. We want to find out why healthcare workers are reluctant to consider working in rural areas, why they are pleased, what makes them happy to work there, what they require to start and continue working in rural areas, and why they leave a position in remote rural areas. And these are among the main five questions. But before I tell you more about it, I have to show you this, for some of you, uh, a rather complicated slide. Uh, I have to tell you that this project, Recruit and Retrain, which started with only focusing on healthcare staff, has changed into a strategic project. This makes the project even much bigger, and uh, which means that we uh, expect the final outcome to be a development of a business plan for private and public uh, organizations uh, to deliver some kind of service packages for recruitment and retention of both healthcare workers and public workers, you know, like uh, teachers and so on, the people working in our own environment. So, uh, so that actually gives the project a, a, a much higher impact and makes it much uh, bigger so we can utilize and hopefully apply the results of the main project which we started with and to another kinds of professions, professionals. And that has a lot to do with, uh, you know, how municipalities work together, and of course the politics have a huge uh, part in that as well. So we work. Uh, for those of you who know, working with uh, in a in a big uh, project uh, like uh, a northern periphery project, we have to uh, produce some products and services, and uh, that's what we are aiming for now, and that's what we want to see by the end of the project. We want to be able to promote the opportunities for healthcare workers to, uh, uh, in remote rural areas. Uh, and we also want to emphasize what are the positive aspects of working in, in remote rural areas. We want to develop ways uh, to reduce professional isolation because that's a very high, uh, well, very important factor in all this. And we also want to uh, generate urban and rural partnership with universities. And I will tell you a little bit more about that later. Um, and, and also with other training bodies and service providers uh, in order to underpin you know, the positive factors of working in these areas. And we also need to find ways how we can support the spouses, social networks, housing, childcare, schooling, etc. Uh, because that is also uh, play a big, plays a big role in all this matter. And finally, we would like to encourage the development of system which enable local remote rural populations or the municipalities to support the healthcare service workers. It's not the sole responsibility of a hospital or a primary care center to recruit and retain. It has to be worked in cooperation with the municipality. So, uh, one part of, um, of our um, means of getting some information uh, of all this matter was to conduct a survey. And I would like, I, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the survey. And I, I, can, uh, I can tell you that this is only the top of the iceberg uh, because um, having a transnational data from eight countries uh, provides a lot of data. 
But uh, we did this online service last uh, autumn, uh, and uh, every partner participated. We had some technical problems with Greenland, but uh, we made it, and we got the results in December. Uh, this, uh, um, this survey was prepared and implemented by the Icelandic team, and also uh, we got a good assistance from the University of Ankara Research Center. And uh, the total responses were almost 5,000 um, uh, yeah, responses, which is quite a lot in that respect. And what we focused on on the survey was mainly uh, to look at uh, different training and education, how we can maintain skills. Uh, we looked at the isolation among employees, and then what kind of psychological effects could be associated with living in rural areas. And uh, we, we had these three group of responders, and obviously the majority were uh, healthcare professionals, licensed, he licensed healthcare professionals. But we also had some responses from uh, students and those post, which we call postgraduate trainees who have just finished their study and are just about to start the career. And uh, from the healthcare profession, uh, this is um, uh, this is how it was uh, represent, uh, represented. Yes, and uh, the majority, of course, are the nurses, which is of no surprise because they um, are the biggest profession. And uh, but. Also, we had almost 80% of the responders who were females. And, uh, um, and then we had these 45% as nurses, and then the doctors were the next uh, group. Everyone, every partner had to get some information from uh, nurses, from doctors, and from midwives. And then we had an option of uh, talking, uh, uh, getting responses from uh, dentists or other healthcare professionals depending on what they would consider a possible problem in their own country. We had a problem to start with. What's urban and what is rural? And I'm sure if you would write down the question, know the answer to that question now, you would have some problems. Uh, and we found out when we started. So because there was no general definition in place of what's considered urban and what's rural, so what is presented here is a general interpretation of the whole group of participants of what's urban and what is rural. And among the participants, communities smaller than 5,000 uh, were regarded as rural by 80% of the responders, while a population above 10,000 um, uh, inhabitants was regarded as urban by 76% of responders. So we decided to use the, the definition of our own responders in, uh, in this study. But yeah, I'm sure it would be very interesting to discuss that later. What do you think? OK. Uh, I'm going to go very fast through these slides. This is just to show you that the doctors seem to have more training in uh, rural areas compared to nurses. I don't know why. Uh, we asked what are the reasons for leaving, and um, these were the main reasons, professional support, limited career possibilities, and family reasons. And then, obviously, we had um, a people, uh, the group um, told, told us that they experienced professional isolation, which is something that we are going to work on. And then, just, I'm not going to go through this, but... For those of you who are, want to know more about the data, this is, um, you can access this online and just go to the, uh, to the website of the main project. So in order to, to draw this together, you know, what are the differences? Uh, there are actually no differences in terms of urban and rural in terms of whether the, uh, whether the education suits the job or not, and the same applies to uh, uh, security. Obviously, there are more education in the urban areas compared to the rural. And, uh, and, and then what might interest you, that financial remuneration is more attractive to rural workers. And, uh, and rural workers do not put, put as much weight on working close to a family. So there were some kind of differences between those who work in the urban and the rural. We had also an issue about the age. And we have to look at that because there are young workers, younger workers, they have a, uh, different pictures compared to those who are more 
mature or at least older uh, in terms of this. So we have to look at that because younger workers, they want to, uh, you know, they are willing to work more, they are more mobile, but they need more mentoring, etc. So we have to be, have to look at that. Uh, and then also the gender issue came out as a big factor as well because we have more females as turned out to be uh, as I told you in the beginning that we had so many females in the um, in the survey and fewer females um, uh, have worked in the rural areas for example and they work more part-time so the picture of their working hours are different than to males and we have to keep all this in consideration when we are recruiting and retaining the staff. You know, what kind of gender are they? And of course, the professional issue is a big thing. And uh, uh, we know that uh, rural workers, they experience professional isolation. And that's a huge factor in all this. And this is something we have to work on. And uh, uh, well, obviously, locum means a lot to those who, who work in the rural areas because they want to be able to get away in order to meet other professionals, etc. So there are different things in terms of what they need in terms of their uh, professionalism. And of course, there is a clear trend towards working in rural area if majority of school education is in rural area. And that's what our experience from Canada and Tasmania and even here has shown us. So it is a, a factor uh, with increased likelihood of working in rural area if you get the clinical training in this area. So we have to look at you know, this early exposures and motivation of stakeholders. And, uh, and we've already st started looking at this in, in a, on a national level, how we can uh, work on the education and in terms of training the, the people working in rural areas. So in summary, there are many factors which affect recruitment and retention of healthcare workers in rural areas. And we have to understand these factors and, uh, and what we can do to facilitate developments for sustainable and good uh, healthcare workforce in these areas. So both professional and social factors are of course important. It's very important to focus on uh, continuing education in order to diminish the professional isolation, which seems to be a big uh, factor. And we also have to get support from the municipalities, from the health authorities, uh, on how we can tackle these problems which we can face in, when we are uh, recruiting um, people in these areas. And, uh, and then we also need to increase, as I say, focus on women and younger generation. And we have to have this early and correct, we are working on what's correct, exposure to healthcare students. So this is, this is not, this, as I say, the sole uh, responsibility of the healthcare um, uh, premises or the healthcare uh, authorities, it has to do with the communities and to do with all of us, to do with politics and everything in terms of how we succeed in recruiting and retaining healthcare workforce and then hopefully in the future all the kinds of workforce as well. Thank you. Discussions, and I'm, I'm looking forward to questions now. And some really good information that came from the uh, So, uh, questions? Probably to both of you. I'm very interested in, in uh, knowing what's what's the trend of out migration here in, in, uh, in Iceland. Is it also like in in uh, Finland or is it in the in the Arctic countries in general? It's sort of like that that uh, urbanization is uh, increasing, and uh, that the small communities are losing. Is it the same here in Thailand? Yes, it has to be. Especially in, in some places in Iceland. Not every place, but, but in some places it has been a de development. Mm -hmm. Yes. There seem to be different levels of rural areas in Iceland and probably mm -hmm. now that some are strong, some yeah. are weak. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that has definitely to do with my presentation about you know what can we do in terms of retaining the people there. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, is it just the work? Is it the laser activities? Is it the housing? Is it possible for schooling? And, and in terms of that, so that has to do with that as well. Yes, uh, uh, first of all, comments for each one. About the birthplaces, I think that uh, 
not all the problems regarding to how this is changes is from the policy makers. I think it's sort of a, a natural development because uh, the professionals have really moved away from mm. some of these areas, both the surgeons and the midwives. Mm. And you can also question a midwife that's in an area where you have five or ten births per year. Is she going to keep up her standards of, of professionalism? I don't know. But I agree with you. Uh, giving childbirth in a car in driving 160 kilometers mm. per hour is probably not the safest place mm. to give childbirth. Mm. But some of these uh, incidences are actually done against the advice of healthcare workers. Mm -hmm. We have to remember mm -hmm. that also. So it's not so. I think it's not a clear policy that this should be mm. put down, but mm. it's, it's, it's a natural development. I, I totally agree with you. It's not an easy thing to decide to, to close down uh, childbirth place or not, and it's, it's, uh, you, can't, uh, you can't secure security all the time in every birth. Uh, but I think it, we have been going too far in closing down childbirth places in Iceland. And I think the, the issue regarding security like uh, we are not talking about how how unsafe it is to give birth on a, in a car driving on a 160 kilometers way or in a snowstorm somewhere in the mountains i think uh, i have to point out that it, this is also dangerous not just if the midwife just have 10 births uh, per year and i know from my own experience that as an experienced midwife working part-time uh, in a hospital uh, you don't forget if you uh, if you are um, going to uh, read a lot and uh, yes and know what you're doing and you have support from others you you know what you're doing it's the technology thing that sometimes is not uh, easy <laughs> but I know it's not an easy part to decide and the money makes uh, a big, big. Uh, uh, it's a support. yes. I I know that. Uh, so I'm not just criticizing. I'm just pointing out that there are uh, many, many things that we have to dis uh, discuss when we are deciding to close down a childbirth place. It's complicated. Also about uh, what Hilde said, I, I hear there is a, a resounding same thing people are talking about here, be it in healthcare or financial problems in uh, Arctic or rural areas in the mm -hmm. north, that uh, we as the researchers need to give the politicians a bag of tools mm -hmm. to work with the local people to mm -hmm. find a solution to their issues. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the main uh, conclusion that we reached. Through. Not everyone is going to have the same solution. It's very diverse. Mm -hmm. We're not all the same between countries and, and, and between areas within countries but we have to give the politician tools and we have to teach them to think outside the box so i think it's pretty the same we're talking about how we can uh, make young people stay in rural areas uh, giving health care service and how we can uh, make people stay young people that are giving birth women <laughs> in the rural areas it's it's the same thing we have to find some way to, uh, that young people have a uh, uh, service, healthcare service that is secure, not just telling them to go and drive for two or three or four hours uh, on, in a snowstorm and, 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 and give birth to their child. So I think it's pretty the same that we are talking about. It's the ways that we have to uh, um, uh, uh, think of in very wide respect. <laughs> I, there are two more questions I saw up here, and then we're getting close to our time. So can both, both of you give your, your questions? Yeah. And we'll... I was thinking, because you said, uh, Inka, that, uh, that um, during the pregnancy, mm -hmm. actually taking care of the woman during the pregnancy is uh, like the key factor in in everything. Yes. But how is it? Okay, you don't have midwife or hospital, but do young women in rural areas have that, or do they always have to drive to get there also? 
Yes, it depends on how you're, where you are uh, living. So in of, some cases, in some health care, uh, yes, yes. Sometimes they get their pregnancy care there, and sometimes they have to dry. I know that, but it's the childbirth that. Uh, yeah, I know, but I was just thinking. Yes. Because you talked about that matters that much, so I was hmm. thinking, do I have to also? Some of them. Because if you are pregnant during the winter time, you don't hmm. want to go out. No. Either. No. I mean, for three no. Hours, no. But perhaps if it's a storm outside, you can you can change your your time and go after two or three days when the weather is getting better. But you can't do that when you are in labor. You have just you just have to go. <laughs> I know you have, you've experienced it. <laughs> you know what you're talking about. Well, this is not what we have actually right now, but this is definitely something that we need to look into because it, it seems like that the female workers are going to be, the, you know, they are, they seem to reflect the majority of the workforce in healthcare, uh, for, uh, in the healthcare area. So we definitely need to think about, you know, is what we offer them in the rural areas, is this the right thing? Or do we have to, you know, do we need some changes in terms of making this more uh, attractive for them working there? So this is just a part of what we might need to, you know, come up with as our final conclusion. But surely we will not have the um, the magic solution, but we will definitely have something to discuss upon. So people start wondering about that, and and we have to, th we definitely have to th to look at the gender issue because it, you only look into universities. I mean, most of the graduates are females, and they seem to want to work in a different way. Yeah. That uh, you know, there's a lot of female Sami go to university mm -hmm. and study something and uh, then leave. Yeah. That's a that's a problem. Mm -hmm. I, I know we're running a, a bit late. May I just make one quick comment? Of, because we experience the same kind of issues, obviously in mm -hmm. Alaska. Yeah. We have very remote communities, far away from the, the medical centers. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you two of the programs that have worked quite well for us in our areas are working with uh, community health aides and community health professionals mm -hmm. that are people who actually live within the communities yeah. where they're trained and then mm -hmm. go back and reside within mm -hmm. their, their community. They, they choose to live there. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're, they're really trained and, and they, they want to be there. And the other piece of that is that now we have a very large uh, telemedicine, telehealth mm -hmm. industry going on yeah. so that they're able to connect yeah. mm -hmm. to doctors in, to, in the larger facilities. And that has worked really well for us. As part of the professional, part of uh, trying to break the professional isolation. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we definitely do something of that, but we can do more about that mm -hmm. as well. Before you go, there are some uh, brochures and um, something which you might want, which you can take with you about this uh, big project. So please feel free to to pick what you want from there. So please, another uh, round for. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Uh, 
Sonia's Deli, Gustav Donner. Is it close? <laughs> Is it close? <laughs> Is an occupational therapist with a master's degree in health promotion and public health now working as an adjunct faculty of health sciences here at the uh, University of Akureyri. Main research interests are uh, perceptions of the public as one important aspect, both on specific mental health issues like depression, as well as on he health care services in general. Sonia is going to talk about public perspective on health care service in rural areas. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, hello everyone, my name is Sonia. Thank you for being here. Very pleased to see all of you. <laughs> my name is, yeah, my name is Sonia and my co-workers in this research I want to introduce to you are Christiana Fenger and Sigríður Haldursdóttir and they're both also working here at the University of Akureyri, UNAC. Here's just a quick overview of my, of my talk. Uh, according to Icelandic law, the aim is that every inhabitant should have the best healthcare service available at each time. But in rural areas, like here in Iceland, long distances and harsh weather circumstances can affect what kind of healthcare, healthcare service is provided and how it is used by the public. So, are everyone sitting at the same table when it comes to healthcare service? One aspect that came out very strong on this conference yesterday is that every, well, is the um, emphasis on that everyone should have a voice, this empowerment. And I relate that to the idea how illogical it is to plan healthcare service. Uh, without knowing what the users think of it and what in fact they feel is needed. So the perspective of the public as a service user is an important factor when investigating health related matters and it cannot be neglected. In the year 2008, I think actually it was during a coffee break, a group of academics here at UNAC uh, got the idea to investigate two small towns in northern Iceland, Ólasfjörður and Siglufjörður, and their social, economic and cultural effects that major road changes that were planned for 2010 to con connect these two towns together would have on them. Uh, there are several research uh, aspects and there's little that we don't have uh, interest in knowing about these two places. But one aspect is uh, related to health. So just to give you a better idea on what I'm talking about. So this is a, a, a part of, of Northern Iceland. Here's North. We are here in Akureyri. Ólasfjörður is here and Siglufjörður here. And before these uh, road changes that are these tunnels through the mountains, those living in Siglufjörður in the winter time had to go this road and well, down here to come to Akureyri. Um, but in the summertime they could go like somewhere here. So this is what it means. In 2009, the, the main differences were that uh, there is a hospital with an emergency, emergency unit in Siglufjörður, but of course there's, a, there's also always a doctor on call and an ambulance available. But like uh, Siglufjörður Inga talked about here before, uh, there's no delivery care in these places. So the aim was to investigate the perception on access to healthcare service, variety and quality among the inhabitants of two small towns in, in northern Iceland before major road changes connecting these two towns together. In this first part of this ongoing research, a household survey was conducted in Ólasfjörður and Siglafjörður. Data was collected late in the year 2009 with a questionnaire 
732 participants completed the survey, and there were two questions about the healthcare service. Uh, and one of this was in three parts or three factors. Um, as you can see here, there were more participants from Siglfjörður than Ólafsfjörður, um, similar numbers of men and women, and the number of participants in each age group, the Vari, but quite, I think they, they quite reflect well the towns, as uh, we, uh, there, there are problems of out-migration of young people. The first question shows that overall, the majority of, of the inhabitants in both places, or 82%, were generally satisfied with the local healthcare service. This is just the, the general. Uh, the second question asked firstly about access to healthcare service. And again, majority, or, or 89%, are very satisfied with the, with the uh, service access. If we take a closer look, we see there's a bit of a difference on how satisfied the inhabitants are uh, with the access, depending on place of, on living. Here, here, and actually here too. Uh, we can also see some uh, gender differences. And looking at the age groups, the oldest age group was most content, with a total of 94% being satisfied. And that's actually the case in all three parts, or, or, or all factors investigated. However, within the, within the two youngest age groups, the percentage on this uh, neutrality, or, 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 or neither nor, was, was high. Um, but because of a distribution in the answers, chi-square significant tests could not be carried out in age. Moving on to the variety, a rate of 68% total was satisfied with the variety of, of service. It's a bit lower than, than with the access, satisfaction with access. Again, taking a closer look, the number of those neither satisfied nor un unsatisfied, and those being unsatisfied was the highest within the three factors investigated. So this part here. Here the perception also varies between place of living, as we can see here and here. Um, there were not so much gender differences, and in the, in the age groups, there were differences between the youngest and the oldest, as we saw in, in, in uh, satisfaction with access. But there are also 30% uh, of those aged 18 to 25 that are rather unsatisfied with the variety of healthcare service. Um, the last factor or part, um, satisfaction with qual quality of the local healthcare service was also valued high, with a total of 78% being satisfied. Looking closer at place, gender and age, inhabitants in Siglfjörður were, were again uh, more satisfied than those in Ólafsfjörður, as we can also see here. There was no, not much difference concerning gender, but there are similar results concerning age, as we saw in, in the question on, on variety. Expe except there's not much, uh, there are not so many uh, unsatisfied here. Uh, so the public is satisfied with the healthcare service. It's interesting that participants were quite pleased with the access to healthcare service, as it is limited in some ways, for example, delivery care. But I think that can be explained that how people define access. Is it access to service in place or that's not in place? And that uh, reflects quite well in the question about variety. Uh, 
There were some differences in how satisfied the inhabitants were. There is a hospital in Siglfjörður, and that might explain why they are more satisfied. Women are a bit more satisfied than men, and they're not as neutral in their answers. And that has maybe something to do with that women are more often caretakers and use healthcare service more often than men, and maybe have a stronger view on it. Both towns have a nursing care home so that people can grow old in their, in their hometown. They do not have to leave. So that could explain why the, the older people are more, more happy. Uh, so I think that satisfaction with the healthcare service can be linked directly to uh, what service there is in place. But of course, this is something that has to be investigated much further with other research methods and I would be so happy if I could show you uh, newer results to show what, what has changed after these road, uh, yeah, major road changes, but that's not the time for it now. Okay, thank you, that's all. I'm also German, so it's just kind of like this. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay, now um, I'm going to try this one too. Yeah. Sigur and Sigur Dotter. Sigur Dotter. Sigur Dotter. Sigur and Sigur Dotter. Thank you. Thank you for pronouncing it correctly for me. <laughs> she is a, a lecturer at the University of Akrari and a PhD student at the University of Iceland. Her research is focused on violence and psychoneural immunology and the consequences of childhood sexual abuse. Last April, she was uh, one of the organizers for the seminar, Health and Well-Being in the Arctic Region here at the University of Akureyri. Her presentation today is about psychological trauma, stress, and violence, consequences for health and well-being. Sigrid. Thank you. Hi. Uh, yes. Um, I uh, got a job here at Akureyri one year ago, and at the same time I, I came into this Arctic dialogue, and it's pretty new for me, and I'm still learning. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in trying to connect my specialty and researches into Arctic dialogue, the consequences of stress and trauma for health and well-being, and how the climate change can affect health and well-being. Well, I want to thank Patricia. Uh, for her lecture yesterday, it was great, because since I came into the Arctic Dialogue, I felt a little bit outside my, or my interest did not fit in to others, because uh, most of the people are talking about oil, mining, law, gas, fishing, and business. And I sometimes feel that people forget that there are people living in the Arctic. And I, I was at the conference uh, last year, where one man said, it seems like we forget that people are living in the Arctic. And, but after listening to Patricia yesterday, and also Robin Bronen, I felt I belong here, so I hope I do. Um, this uh, lecture is connected to my uh, PhD thesis because I'm, I'm talking about uh, uh, psychological trauma and stress and health human being. That's why I, I just tell you about my co-workers, Sigurði Haldarsdóttir, Sóli Bender, Berglind Gumstur og Gunn Ragnarsdóttir. And uh, my researches are uh, about child sexual abuse, uh, which is a, a psychological trauma. But I think uh, it doesn't always matter what kind of trauma we are talking about. It always can always affect the body and, and the health. So I am, my research is mainly on child sexual abuse, but I'm also looking at uh, psycho uh, neuroimmunology. <laughs> uh, uh, it's about... Um, uh, how the, the trauma affects the body. But uh, last year, um, I was, uh, last year I, I participated in the project group, Noria Net. Uh, it was to design a good life under different climate and economic scenarios in the Arctic. And these were the, the main thesis we talked about. But at the end, uh, they, they decided to focus on food and water security because it's, was a, it's a huge uh, problem, will be. Uh, so you can see uh, that uh, climate change 
can affect all these factors. But my uh, interest is in how to live in, in the in uncertainty of uh, climate change, a stressor for well-being and mental health, uh, uh, the safety, and the violence, accident, and suicide. This is the, the uh, what I would like to focus on in the future. But uh, why, um, when I start preparing for this lecture, I was wondering why I decided to talk about psychological trauma in the Arctic. What's the connection? And uh, I think after listening to Patricia yesterday, uh, all the things she was talking about was about psychological trauma. And the only words she didn't mention or I didn't hear was psychological trauma. So I really could connect her lecture to my interest. Um, because uh, most of them lead to psychological trauma with consequences like depression, alcohol abuse, suicide, as she mentioned. But what is psychological trauma? Why are we talking about that? A person can experience psychological trauma when he or she experiences safe circumstances where he or she is in danger or witnesses fearful incident, where death or near death occur, serious injury, threat to his or her own health or others. And this is, these are situations that are, people are going through in the Arctic, especially Alaska and, and the, the places. And what kind of, uh, what causes, what can cause psychological trauma? Not all the people go through this, but, but this is some of it. Losing someone to death, uh, violence, sexual abuse, bullying, being victim of an alcoholic parent, uh, alcoholic, alcoholic problem is, is um, it's, a, it's much in, in Alaska and Greenland, uh, long-term illness, accidents, life-threatening medical condition, medication, induced trauma, uh, earthquake, Volcanic and flood, uh, you were talking about yesterday in, in Alaska, where the water is, is uh, eating the land, as you can say. And losing something, losing their job, losing their home, their health, or their body parts. And people going through psychological trauma, if they don't get help, they will, they can. Uh, develop post-traumatic stress disorder, which, which can have uh, terrible uh, consequences for health. In the beginning, consequences of trauma and, and PTSD were mainly connected to mental health problems such as depression, anxiety, phobia. Later, they found out that people experience psychological trauma are increasing risk of heart disease, cancer, stroke, bronchitis, and diabetes. Uh, increased body ma mass index, uh, the stress response immune system, and alcohol use disorder, and it's a, gr it's a huge uh, public health problem. It's evident that the indigenous, indigenous, do I pronounce it right? Indigenous population of Alaska, Canada, and Greenland have much higher rates of unintentional injury and suicide. Unintentional injuries have always been fact of life for those who live close to the land. Many accidents are now alcohol-related, and misuse of alcohol is a major determinant, determinant for ill health and social problems among indigenous communities of the North. Suicides were not common before 1950. They did occur among the elderly and infirm. This contrasts sharply with pattern of adolescent suicide, 15 to 24 years old now. Men, uh, it's often among men, but female, they, this, they try often suicide attempts. Well, in, in my uh, group, uh, project group I was in, um, they talk about secondary health effect of climate change. And secondary health effect of climate change are those that occur as a result of environmental and human behavioral change that are mediated by climate. This includes social and mental stress related to change in environment or lifestyle brought about by changes in climate.
and the stress of not knowing the extent of the effect of climate change can cause illness and diseases. Uh, for example, tourism will likely increase uh, when, when, with the climate change. Uh, public and private services will increase to support emerging, emerging economies. All these events will challenge the traditional subsistence way of life for many communities, communities and lead to accelerated and long-term cultural change, which will create additional stress on an already vulnerable population. Uh, and, 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 and when you talk about the, the delayed freeze-up and, and changes in the ice, uh, storm events uh, also place residents at high risk for unintentional injury and for chronic stress. And as we talked about yesterday, when the ice is getting thinner, the, the hunters go out and they often draw, fall down and drown, and people don't, don't see them again. The effect, uh, as they said, uh, the effect of the climate change and environmental population on the next generation could be profound with the most sensitive members of the population being the fetus, newborn, children and women at, of reproductive age. Uh, we talk about, and, and the, 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 the who uh, estimate approximately 25% of death in children under age of five are caused by uh, environmental factors. We talk about the uh, tertiary health effects of climate change. And dislo dislocated families and communities will have to adapt to new ways of living, may face unemployment, and will have to in integrate and create new social bonds. Re relocation, as they talked about yesterday, may also lead to a rapid loss of traditional culture, exacerbating stressor and mental health challenges. And this all can cause depression, anxiety, substance abuse, and suicide. Uh, Psychonoro immunology. This is my favorite. Saulo toiga onamisfrae, or Islandsku in Icelandic. This is how uh, dynamic and complex interaction among behavioral factors, the central nervous system, and the endocrine and immune system. Uh, they talk about every human is total whole, body and soul and what breaks down the soul also breaks down the body. There is no real distinction between soul and body. So uh, we can hardly talk about just physical symptoms and mental symptoms because we are whole. But since the research on psychoneuroimology came through, it's possible to describe some of the possible mechanisms how psychological trauma can af affect the health and researchers in the PNI, just called PNI, are useful to understand these effects since many health problems and illness are because of severe or overwhelming stress because of PTSD. Uh, how can, to see how can trauma affect the health, just in easy way to see. Uh, People go through psychological trauma with all, with all these factors I mentioned, and it's, it depends on how we experience the the ex, uh, the yeah how how we experience it, and and if it's a trauma, it, it makes a tension in the body. Or you have all gone through some kind of trauma almost. It's not psychological trauma; it's a physical trauma because we start breathe faster, ha a heart. Uh, we sweat, we, we, all the body is responding. It's a, it's a shock for the brain, and the brain uh, sends out the message to all the body, to the nervous system, to the hormone system, and it's breathing, heart, skin, uh, all the body is get the tension. In the beginning, uh, people with trauma, they, they lose sleep, they can't sleep, it's often the first part. Uh, they, they feel fe fear and insecurity. Later they develop an anxiety or depression, and it's going to be chronic stress. Uh, they get muscle strain, later chronic pain, because if your muscles are always stuff, uh, stiff, you get pain. It's, it's, it's easy to see that. And people always have overactive response system. If you're living like in, as you mentioned, in Alaska, where you're always expecting your home 
to get uh, in the water. You're always in tension. You're always afraid, and and your ne nervous system and and your your uh, active response system is always ready to fight, and that's not good. You can't relax. Uh, it's not so. Can you see what's standing there? Okay. It's it just how it works. Stress uh, goes to the brain, and the brain sends the message to the uh, adrenal cortex, and and it goes into the immune system. Uh, psychological trauma can lead to post-traumatic stress disorder, and it's it's chronic stress. And we know that chronic stress suppresses the immune system. That's nothing new. It's we know that. So uh, immune system is the control over the diseases, and now they are um, talking much about the inflammation in the body, because the inflammation is a huge thing for the, the health. So the immune system, if this uh, stress uh, suppressed the immune system, it affects the defense system, uh, inflammation, infection, and, and cancer. Uh, this is a photo I got just from the uh, internet. Just how, just how, just to see how easy it is. It's stress and, and the brain, when the stress is always ongoing, the, the brain start to uh, just uh, don't send the right message, and the health and well the health problems that can come from stress are like chronic pain, fibromyalgia. Yeah, I'm not telling that all these people with fibromyalgia are uh, caused by stress, but likely. Um, yeah, tremor, fat fatigue. Blood pressure, high, higher blood, blood pressure, gastrointestinal problem, obesity, asthma, uh, transmitted sexual disease, depression, anxiety, phobia, alcohol, drug, food, self-destructive behavior that people uh, try to uh, damage themselves, and stress and trauma can affect relationships spouse, children, and family. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm finished. I have enough time. <laughs> well, good. Uh, yeah. well, I'm used to talk without papers because I'm used to talk about this Icelandic, but now I'm hanging on my <laughs> paper, so to try to say the right words. <laughs> questions now. Thank you. Um, I know that I suffer from some of those uh, yeah. PTSD. Okay. <laughs> and I, so I can very well relate to what you're saying. Good. So, Good. <laughs> questions? Yes, uh, I have a question to Sonia about the research. Uh, 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 a few questions and, and comments. Uh, you mentioned about the tunnel in the beginning of the research. Did you have any comparison of the uh, research before and after the tunnel? And, and if, I, if I just make so you can comment on all. And another thing you were wondering about the, the high percentage of neither nor in the younger age groups, but we know that uh, if you don't have a non applicable answer, the younger age group who have often no contact at all to the health service, they're probably going to write mm -hmm. neither nor because they don't have the answer to the question. Mm -hmm. And also, I'm not surprised that the people did think the wide variety was all right because we have done work with the with the healthcare professionals in this area and asked them what do you have and what do you need? And surprisingly enough, most of these small towns have what they think they need. There's no one gonna expect a neurosurgeon to work in an owner's government and do his work there. They they move there and they know what they have and they're with it in, in most cases. Mm -hmm. So I'm not surprised. Yes, thank you. Uh, these results are just before the tunnel. So this is just kind of like a baseline. And then we just add results uh, now when we start again with another household survey. So this is only before. I know we, that's why we don't have any comparison or anything like that. It's just the just baseline. Uh, what you said about the people, I think people, I've also been uh, doing uh, qualitative research in this area and what you say about the people it's like 
they're very strong. They're, they're not like, oh, I want this, I want that, I want this. They're just like, oh, I don't have access to this. Okay, I will work with it and just move on. They're so, I don't know, very strong somehow. But it's also the case when a, when a new doctor arrives, for example, in Olasfjörder, just a primary uh, healthcare doctor, you know, people, the whole town tends to visit just to get a second opinion and just to have, you know, a new face to talk to because some, think, some people think that they don't get the right service from the, from the primary care doctor that's in place. So there are many aspects, I think, but yeah. question by comment or observation because usually we tend to look at this kind of uh, consequences in terms of human well-being referring to indigenous peoples because they are first at the front line yes but uh, it came to my mind listening to your presentation that we also have two other groups which could be uh, checked in terms of, of these processes and this uh, Situations. I would think here about immigrants from southern parts of, of the globe, how they adopt, how they uh, live with these circumstances, uh, how they are vulnerable for, for these uh, dangers. And the second group, which can be also interesting to take a look, uh, especially when we expect that some kind of activities, economic activities, will be grow. I am thinking about sailors, mm -hmm. I am thinking about people uh, working in uh, oil and gas industry. Mm -hmm. Quite often they also will be coming from the south. Mm -hmm. And their well-being and mm -hmm. their mental health mm -hmm. will be extremely important for the public security or environmental safety. Mm -hmm. Because uh, usually the, the jobs will be very, very responsible. Yeah. So, it may be interesting also to, 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 to think about this kind of, of new yeah. to some extent, uh, challenges in terms of public health and the progress for like climate change. Yes, thank you. I just totally agree. It's very interesting to think about these things too. My research uh, about the Arctic and the, the, the stress there, that's not, not my research. It's just the articles I found on the internet. Uh, but they don't have many researchers on the, uh, the physical health from stress in the Arctic. They, I don't think they have it. I don't know. Do you know it? If it has looked into They have, I can find a lot of articles about mental health and climate change, a lot, a lot of them, but I didn't find articles about uh, climate change and physical health and and like that's that no but uh, that's why I because I have just looking into psychological trauma from from abuse such child abuse so there I found my my articles and I, I just talk about uh, the psycho no, neuroimmunology uh, articles about stress in common so we need researches on this I think That's right. And I was just wondering if that's, that's yeah. the size of the No, it's, I, I just think we need to look better into it uh, if it's also common there. As I'm from a small community. I'm, I'm from the west coast on the Iceland, Isafjörður, and grew up there, and I used to live in Olasfjörður. Mm -hmm. And the people there are different from Reykjavik. <laughs> so I know this small population. Time. Some of the data we're trying to actually look at now in Alaska, we're hoping is going to begin to capture okay. some of the physical okay. uh, concerns as well. Right yeah. now it's not listed, no. you know, we can't get anybody to say that these are climate related deaths right. or injuries, so we're working with some of our federal it's going agencies to, be. to, to uh, look at that more closely. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. Yeah. Sigrun, are you aware of the, the masses in, in health and well-being in the circumpolar areas at the University of Oulu? 
Finland? Yeah. And are you aware of that? Um, there's this program? Yeah, I'm going there, this fall. Ah, okay. Yeah, okay. I'm going to this, uh, there's a, uh, there's a, I'm, um, I'm taking a course there, this, now in September. Okay. There are five courses about violence in, in Oulu now, and I'm going there. <laughs> so I'm going get, to get a better connection. Yeah. That's great. Yes. I think the, the Greenlanders have done some research on the physical health. Okay. Indigenous people okay. in recent years, and you're pr probably going to meet some of them when you go. Yeah, to Olu. I'm looking forward to, to go there and, and get connection. Mm. Although they're still, even in Greenland, I work a lot with Greenland health statistics, it's not the same kind of data. They, they, they still aren't connected to clinical trials and health statistics. No, not to the mm. climate change, but yeah. They, they, yeah. they have some data on the, on the health. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. We yeah. do that kind of in Alaska as well, but mm. it's not climate mm. related. Yeah. I guess that was my point, um, yeah. is that we need to start actually showing that there is a link yeah. to what's happening. Yeah, climate change and health related are symptoms. Are council working on something like that? Um, hmm. uh, I, I don't think so. Yeah, yeah that, not, that I'm, not that I'm aware of. I'm trying to uh, relate everything because we're talking about people living in a situation where something is happening can't do anything about it, and you feel that you are unempowered. Because my work has been to work with people that are have no have had no power. Our mental health have been in mental health institutions or you know just got into the mental health system and they have felt that they had nothing to say. Mm -hmm. They just have to say if I do this just very easy. Do what the doctor says. Mm -hmm. But they didn't get any better. Mm -hmm. Those who were staying. Can we use, my aim was can we use some of this work to uh, you know, get ideas to empower people to have a say, like in the flood areas in Alaska, because what I've been doing is I've been you know, working with people as co-researchers, so they take mm -hmm. the data, they yeah. are interviewing, they are setting up the database, they are saying what is important, mm -hmm. they are saying it's different in Olafsjöndur and Siglifjöndur because we are not supposed as professionals if we come in to say you need this and this. Maybe they need it, but if they don't feel that they need mm -hmm. it, why bother? Because mm -hmm. I think it's often that the speciality that we have as specialists, we are all, always telling people what they need. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are. And suddenly <laughs> they need it when they have never felt that they need it. I'm a little bit mm -hmm. scared of Professionalism, it's good, but it's also bad in, yeah. in a way. You know, just yeah. Isn't that where really interdisciplinarity comes into play? Because yeah. um, it's, I, when, when you kind of isolate these certain fields of expertise all the time, then of course, then you go into the communities and say, hey, you need this, and although you don't even know anything about the communities. Yeah. And, and that's that's something where I think that's so that's why it's so good that there are so many different disciplines now here, because I yeah. don't know anything about this. Mm -hmm. But this is so important for me, for my mm -hmm. research too, to Good. also kind of think about these mm -hmm. things, you know, yeah. and, and so that, that in order to really kind of counter this, this uh, what you just said, you know, to work together with the communities, obviously, and, mm -hmm. and also with researchers yeah. and so on, and elders, and of mm -hmm. course. There actually are a lot of programs now that really do uh, have, uh, have great influence uh, from community-based and community-initiated research. Yeah. Um, that, that that really is a, yeah. a, a new way of looking at, at yeah. doing science and research is mm -hmm. that you're doing what the community wants. Yeah. And then you find a researcher who's interested in the same thing mm -hmm. instead of the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, it works out better that way, I think, for everyone. Mm -hmm. so. It was also they compared uh, surveys. Often when you're doing this satisfaction of a service, around 80, 85% are always happy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you need to know what the 15%, you need to grab into what do they want to work with because you can't, you often don't get that from the survey. So you are using that with your in a, in a qualitative yeah. and focus groups, then you really can mm -hmm. get more information because it tells you 85%. Yeah, yeah. Do we it's need very to limited. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's happy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not why or, or how or anything. Mm -hmm. But that's so, you know, this this debate always comes back, at least, or I come back <laughs> to, to always the question of need. And uh, so who defines needs? Mm -hmm. And that's something I think mm -hmm. which is 
fundamentally important to, mm -hmm. to I don't know if you have to define needs in the first place, but, but uh, if there is a need to define the need, <laughs> then uh, it's really a matter of who defines it for whom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, because there are, especially when it comes to um, to uh, politics or politicians, suddenly there is they say you need this, and then the community say, no, we don't. Mm -hmm. Or they say, no, you don't need that, and the community say, yes, we do. You know, And so that's always a very, yeah. very tricky. Yeah, and talking thing. about politicians, I think it's very healthy for us that are demanding we want resources and we can't, we can't get this, this, that, and all. To put ourselves in the shoes of the politicians, he has a certain amount of money. How in the hell he can he know what he's doing with the money? He really wants to do good things. Mm -hmm. I, I, I feel that those that have been uh, known are the politicians because we've been chasing them a lot here tonight and <laughs> I don't bother to get to know them anymore because after. Two years I've gone, and <laughs> and you because it really takes time to make connections. Yeah. To get, yeah. But uh, and through these years, I really know that they are in a hard position. So my approach now is more to uh, see how they, uh, you know, get into the pain. <laughs> yeah, so I try to understand them. <laughs> yeah. Because it's not easy for them. Either. No. They are not our. Yeah, they yeah. are our collaborators. That's right. And that's where. Lastly, you know, I said several times it's all about knowledge. Is there is not only one knowledge, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's exactly always what, what I find when also working with the communities that I work with. You know, it's to to apply all these different kind of knowledges about certain elements mm -hmm. and and uh, try to figure out a way to kind of write it up, write it all down. <laughs> it's about the humanity of the researcher. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you try to try to respond to some need. And you give the people that our tools, and they decide if they want to use it or not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But but when you give them the tools, they should be. At, we should, as a researcher, have some home or refinement, so they are applicable tools if you want to use them. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's it's each society or each group has to decide on their own if they want to use these tools. But if they do. We, it's our sort of the responsibility to make sure that they're, they're good to mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I think it's also the responsibility of the researchers and the people working in the communities to encourage and force the funding sources to work through and with the communities. Because oftentimes, a funding source may decide what the community mm. needs or what mm. they should have. And then they yeah. hire a researcher mm. who then is put in the position of, of determining that data or making that tool, yeah. but the funding source may not have any inclination to make that applicable to the community. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a huge responsibility there yeah. uh, for the to do that and, make, and move that forward. If only, if only we could have that happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Usually, research is to try to get the money where, it, mm. where they can, mm -hmm. but they try to get it to, from uh, organizations that are sort of working in the same direction as the researchers. Probably. We've had some, some success, I'll tell you, at least in the U.S. with some of our major funders, uh, federal agencies. For instance, now uh, researchers who work in our communities in the Arctic have to agree to, uh, to follow the protocols. Of working within those communities, and you either sign on that you agree mm -hmm. that you will work with the, the communities in these particular ways, yeah. or you don't get the funding. Okay. And they now um, mandate that they have people within the community who are partners, so that they actually have to to have a, a presence there and people mm -hmm. who know what they're doing. They have to bring back the research into the communities mm -hmm. and can't just put it out on their shelf somewhere or send it out to everybody. So there are some real the, we've had some success in in. Um, and mandating that with mm. federal funding. Isn't that also the case in Nuno, for example? Yes, but yeah, they, they pretty but much can decide what exactly they want to do. Yeah. So. Mm. We have a similar system in Canada. Yeah. All researchers right. have to apply for licenses in the mm -hmm. territories okay. that grant those licenses to the researchers. Okay. And when you're looking at health issues in particular, yeah. it's a much more <coughs> and you do have to have these connections with the community. Uh, yeah. So there are good models out yeah. there, I think, for people to take a look at. Yeah. The EU also has some sort of protocols that you need to follow yeah. that determines that you 
you have to have resources that are in, you can use in certain areas. Mm -hmm. So I was going to just give you a, a, an example of um, one of our communities in Alaska, Kivalina. That's uh, one of those communities that's uh, having to relocate. Mm -hmm. And the kinds of real problems that they're beginning to see between the elders and the youth yeah. in, in that particular community. This is a community that's uh, right on the water. And it's, it's losing ground more and more every mm -hmm. single day. They've lost their primary um, water source so that there's no drinking water left at all within their, their community. They had to shut down the school mm -hmm. for almost a month period of time because there was no drinking water available for the kids. This community has already voted to, to move, um, but there's a real big difference between the elders who want to move mm -hmm. and the children who do not want to move. Okay. Yeah, and so it's become quite a... Um, um, a major problem in just having communication and discussion. And there's a lot of anger, mm -hmm. a lot of frustration. Um, the kids are acting out okay. in all kinds of ways, and the elders mm -hmm. are feeling really abused. <laughs> but the elders have been through, um, you know, they're, they're nomadic people, and they're, so they were sort of used to living in different places, mm -hmm. and the kids have never known yeah. anything but where they are now. And so they don't want to. So these are just mm. some of the things that are our realities that, yeah. that we're trying to live with. So what you were saying mm. was, yeah. was exactly what's happening. Yeah, that's what, that's why I was very happy to talk to speak today, not yesterday, because after listening to you and and the other woman, it was it's great to see the picture, how it really is. It's how it is. Okay, I think thank you. Heard you. Any other questions? Let's give another hand to our great speaker. Thank you all very much, and now we're uh, where are we off to. Um, back to the recording sessions. Thank you for your help. Thank you.